Okay, I am here with uh, Professor Miller. Uh, can I start off by asking you uh, what is your connection to the University of Cincinnati? Um, I actually am. Um, I, I, for most of my career, I was a professor of geology. I'm a paleontologist by trade. Um, I started as a faculty member um, in the university in 1986. Um, eventually, I became the head of the Department of Geology, and then for a brief time, director of environmental studies, uh, and then an associate dean, and then a senior associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I retired officially three years ago, um, almost a, a little bit more than three years ago in June. Um, and now I'm back for five months and five months only as acting divisional dean in natural sciences. But I would say that for the most part, I'm currently a professor emeritus. <laughs> uh, what was your work at UC? Um, by trade, I'm a paleontologist. And so um, my work was a combination of research in my field um, which is paleontology. I can, if you're interested, I can tell, could tell you a little bit more about that. But in addition, I, I taught courses uh, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, um, including one course that I taught um, in retirement um, in, the, in the fall before COVID. And that was actually a new course on extinction. And one of the things I really liked over the years is teaching um, sort of intro level-ish, non-majors courses on the history of life um, which is something that I do have worked on in my research, extinction and changes in biodiversity through geological time and trying to relate those more and more to uh, the present day biodiversity crisis. So that has affected both my uh, research and my teaching and my advising of graduate students um, over the years. Uh, I, um, uh, yeah, and, and more and more I've, I've, what I've tried to do, um, regardless of the various things that I've worked on, within my field is to not only, um, I guess, uh, do science that I hope is interesting uh, to my scientific community, but also to try to relate it um, where appropriate um, to larger scale societal questions that we're concerned about. What years were you associated with the University of Cincinnati? Ah, okay, so just again, um, I started in 1986, uh, straight out of grad school, um, and. Uh, um, retired officially, it would have been, let's see, it's 2021, so it would have been June 2018. Um, but I guess I'm still associated, as I said already. What changes have you seen over your association with the University of Cincinnati? This might include uh, teaching methods or administrative uh, structure. Uh, or anything, I guess. <laughs> yes. um, uh, let me count the ways. Um, I would say the administrative structure um, has not changed enormously. Um, uh, but um, uh, I think the, a, a couple things that I would, that I would say, um, physically the university has changed immensely and uh, when I first uh, came here, um, the campus wasn't very nice. Uh, it was not a, not a pleasant place to, to be. Um, Cincinnati, the university I think had been about 10 years into being a state university at that point. Prior to that I think it was a city level university. Um, but it was still very much making the transition. Um, and at the time, it was as much as anything a computer school. Not that many, there were, there were dormitories on campus, but not nearly as many as there are now. There were not fun things to do on campus. Uh, the gym was lousy, um, you know, et cetera and so forth. And uh, over the years, the physical plant of the university has been completely rebuilt, um, which has made it, even though I, at times I was skeptical of all the building that was going on, I have to, I can't really argue with the final product. It's a much more attractive place to be. And that, in turn, I think has helped to attract um, at least some students who might not have come here um, otherwise. And so that's obviously a big change. Also, what I can see in recent years, um, intellectually, although I still think the university has a ways to go, um, is that there's much more interest in getting out of the silos of what we do within our fields and the beginnings of collaborations across different disciplines among different groups of people, some of which I, I engaged in uh, with colleagues in biology, for example, uh, near the end of my run uh, before I retired. Um, but now this is being formalized more and more with some of the new programs um, and some of the new initiatives uh, in recent years at the university. So this is a good thing to see in my view and I hope it continues because that should be the future. Uh, can you go uh, into further detail about how the campus has changed over time? Uh, well, uh, I, I started talking about that a little bit. Um, when I first got here, uh, the, uh, 
So my, my office was and still is, I still have an office, although not a lab anymore, in the geology physics building. That building was under construction um, when I first uh, arrived at Cincinnati. And um, so I was, at that time, I was in a building um, called Old Tech, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was one of four or five buildings that sat between McMicken Hall um, and uh, Tangerine University Center. Um, and so to me, that's sort of emblematic of, of a major change on campus physically. Um, those buildings were all knocked down and they were replaced with grass. And so McMicken Green didn't exist before. Um, and also there were lots of other, there were lots of surface parking lots on campus uh, that have basically been removed and replaced with grass as well. Sigma Sigma Commons, um, you know, the area between those dorms that were reconstructed um, and, uh, and where the College of Business and the soon-to-be College of Law are located in the former College of Business building. That whole area was once a parking lot in between it and it's not anymore, it hasn't been for many years. And so over the years, a lot more green space has been created on campus and obviously an enormous number of new buildings. I remember um, at the time that the, there was, Tangerine University Center was completely reconstructed. The dormitory and that sits over the, the swimming pool and the gym, all of that was new. Um, and a lot of that was done at one time. And um, so I remember flying over the university, coming back from a meeting, I think, once um, when all of that was happening. I think it was the early 2000s. Um, and it looked like I was flying over a quarry. You know, the whole center of campus was a construction site, and you had to go around it, you know, to, to go anywhere. Um, they had put up these on the quadrangle in front of uh, the engineering quadrangle, basically, um, where Baldwin is um, in old tech. There was a big tent. Uh, we called it the grease tent because that's where the food court was temporarily while they were redoing Tangerine University Center. Um, and so all of a sudden all that stuff was done and it really it, it transformed um, the university, sort of the central spine, what they call Main Street now. You know, everything that was sort of surrounding uh, was constructed, if not quite simultaneously, nearly so, you know, and um, I, I think that that was transformative. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the campus expansion uh, in the past and the present, or how might have you handled the campus expansion? Oh, how I might have? Um, I, as I, as I kind of suggested before, I was a little bit um, skeptical um, because at, at first, and I think a lot of my colleagues were as well, because especially in my early years here, it was a bit of a struggle to get, we felt it was a bit of a struggle to get the respect, get faculty to get respected by the central administration. Um, at the same time that all these new buildings were being, you know, where, where the construction was beginning. And we were concerned, some of us were concerned at the time, many of us, that, um, you know, there were some misplaced priorities putting the physical plant of the university over the intellectual and academic plant. But um, it's hard to argue with the result. Um, you know, it, it's hard to imagine where you see it would be, at least in my view, um, would be now had that transformation of the campus um, to a place where people actually want to be <laughs> um, had that not taken place, um, you know, and I'm not unmindful of that, I have to admit. Uh, how was the University of Cincinnati connected to the city and urban issues during your time at the university? Um, I think that's an ongoing um, uh, struggle is maybe too strong a word, um, uh, but it, it I felt, I, I, at the time when I first got here, I felt that the university was perhaps especially insular in some ways. Um, that began to change, at least in my recollection, uh, when Nancy Zimfer was president and she started re referring to the, I think it was President Zimfer who started referring to the university as an urban research university. Um, and momentum in that direction has, has continued over the years, but um, I'm hopeful that it will continue to pick up. You know, the, the city of Cincinnati um, provides um, a real, um, in some, some ways, in some cases natural and in some cases unnatural laboratory, um, you know, for uh, issues running, running the gamut of what, of intellectually, what the university does. Um, you know, everything uh, from, it's just about, just about every subject you, you, um, you could think of, you know, whether it's in the natural or social sciences, humanities, arts, uh, you name it. Um, 
there are th there are experiences that Cincinnati has had, um, and you know is currently having um, that are very important to study. Not only because it would be good for the city, um, but because it's 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 at this it's at simultaneously it would be important for the city for the university to be a real partner um, with uh, the city and the region in solving problems. Um, but at the same time, it it's obviously has relevance beyond Cincinnati. Cincinnati is a microcosm example of um, so many things that um, I think are important for uh, you know, urban centers and surrounding areas and other regions as well. Um, and uh, we've got a real opportunity here to, um, uh, to take advantage in a positive way um, of, of, of those uh, uh, resources may not be quite the right term, um, but those uh, features of Cincinnati, um, including things that have not gone so well over the year, and I feel in some respects, and this is a long-winded answer, I apologize, I feel in some respects that the university has not been the best citizen, um, you know, and the best partner, um, and uh, um, I'm hopeful it seems to be changing now. Um, I'm hopeful that, hopeful that that will continue to evolve. I also get concerned a little bit that, you know, not just with respect to um, you know, the transitions on campus, but some of the some of the changes going on around the campus. You know, and lots of lots of places where new apartments have gone up and things like that, um, and other things have been removed. You know, I think have been done. And I've seen universities in other cities do the same thing. The University of Chicago where I got my PhD, um, did this in a big way in the area right around there, and they basically took it over. And it's not always to the benefit of, uh, of people who were living in those neighborhoods prior to the transitions. Uh, what personal experiences did you have with race and racial issues at the University of Cincinnati? Um, uh, I, 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 as part of my work, um, I've been very interested in, in, in Diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I um, I was part of a, a program uh, called Leaf. It's an acronym. I don't remember what it, st what it stands for anymore. But uh, I was actually on on one of the steering committees for Leaf for a few years. It was an NSF funded project, and it started off as uh, something focused on focused on um, on faculty, and it started off primarily focused on. Um, on the development and advancement of women faculty, but it eventually broadened out also to consider under, uh, underrepresented minorities. And um, I played a role, um, this is just an example, I played a role in, um, uh, in sort of assessing how the program was doing um, and in making suggestions uh, for how it move, would, you know, might move forward uh, more effectively. Um, and got interested in a range of different questions um, that I continue to be interested in now and might even have an impact on in my next few months uh, with respect to things like um, uh, integrating um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion issues more directly into reappointment, promotion, uh, and tenure, and also community-based research, um, which I think is important uh, for collaborating with surrounding areas. Um, also, that's sort of one part of it um, in an administrative context, um, but um, I guess another thing uh, has to do with my own field, which is paleontology, which is um, the field of paleontology and, and um, uh, the field of geology in general um, is not very diverse at all. In fact, it's one of the, maybe, the, if not the least diverse science, uh, one of them in the, you know, in the natural sciences. And we've been very concerned about that. And uh, so over the years, and I I've, I've was recently president of the Paleontological Society. This is something that we talked about uh, quite a bit. And in, in addition to sort of to um, you know in, in, in enhancing our outreach efforts um, and and sort of you know broadening broadening our educational efforts. Um, we've also realized that, that one of the problems with geology is in terms of advertising it, you know, as something that people might major in when they're in college. Um, and I made this mistake when I was head of the department. We, we played up too much, you know, being out of doors and going out and camping, um, you know, and, and that was successful in attracting uh, potential students who like to do that kind of thing because they grew up that way. But there aren't many people who grew up in an inner city who necessarily feel that way. And the fact is that 
Uh, science of geology is much more eclectic than that anyway, and we ought to be talking about the range of things that a geologist does, not just out in the field, but also on a computer, uh, in a laboratory, um, and elsewhere. And we, so we could be doing a much more effective job of talking about the, the own practical diversity of our own science in a way um, that I think would, would attract a more diverse audience and a more diverse pipeline. Um, and so that's something I've thought about and we're, we're taking action on, um, um, you know, more and more. Um, also, um, you know, this, this has been an interesting time to be at the university in the past, um, uh, you know, half decade plus, uh, ever since the shooting of Samuel DeBose, which um, um, impacted the university community, uh, obviously. And I was just coming into my job as senior associate dean in the college as, as after the shooting and um, you know, try to um, um, and really play a role in college and university dialogue. Um, and uh, last year, um, uh, in the spring, um, after George Floyd was murdered, um, just the, um, I was afraid uh, that, um, I felt that in the, um, after the DeBose shooting, there was all this ferment and then it kind of faded away. And I was afraid that that would happen again and so, I just started talking to people about that and it still concerns me that um, we saw this as a galvanizing moment um, and but I want to make sure that the university moves forward in a different way as a result of those moments and I'm not yet convinced that that's happening and so this is something that I want to um, continue to have conversations about um, you know with various people who make decisions. <coughs> Uh, did you witness any student protests? Uh, can you describe what happened, if so? No. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen, I, I certainly saw some protests uh, during my years on, down on Main Street and um, participated in a couple, but also it depends upon if you want the student protest to be on campus or off. I, I was downtown with a lot of our students and many other people uh, last spring, for example, you know, right in the middle of a, of a couple of marches, including I think the biggest march. Um, I. I had ever seen in my time in Cincinnati um, that originated on Fountain Square and then went uh, through streets of downtown and ultimately ended up at the courthouse, um, I think it was on a Sunday, um, a year ago, spring. Um, and you know, certainly the, the, those I thought were very, uh, very impactful and, and really meaningful um, and impressive. Um, I've seen, um, you know, some, sometimes that, that was sublime. I've also seen the ridiculous when we've had a few um, uh, people uh, come on campus and, and just literally almost stand up on a milk crate and tell, and, tell, uh, and tell students as they're walking by and then gathering around them that they're, um, uh, they're all going to hell, you know, for various reasons. They're sinners in various ways and then, you know, this, this sort of goes, um, uh, goes back and forth. Um, and so, um, yeah, there have been some very meaningful protests that have taken place. Um, in, the, in the wake of the DuBose shooting, I went to um, various meetings, um, some of which took place organized by student groups um, in, uh, in Tangerine University Center, um, among other places, and a couple of teach-ins, actually, um, that, again, I thought were very effective at, at getting messages out. I just want to make sure that, the, that they lead somewhere instead of um, ultimately being forgotten. <coughs> How well do you think the University of Cincinnati has dealt with uh, race and students of color during your time? With race and students of color? Yes. Um, I think that they, they this is, um, I'm being earnest here, I, I, I think they've, there's now a chief diversity officer and that position did not exist, I don't think, when uh, when I started here, and certainly not for many years after I'd been here, um, I, I'm a little concerned and continue to be concerned that the, the university, you know, wants to be seen as responsive and genuinely, genuinely wants to be responsive, um, but there are certain things that need to happen that have not happened yet, I think probably because they would cost a lot of money. <laughs> um, and. Uh, um, and I think they stand in the way of real change. In my view, um, first and foremost, this university needs more faculty of color. Um, and if there, were, if there were many more faculty of color, and we need many more faculty of color, 
that would that in turn, I think, would have a knock-on effect on uh, our, both our undergraduate and graduate student populations in a very positive way. Um, but that takes a real investment, um, and uh, I have not seen that forthcoming. Um, I was hopeful that that we might see the beginnings of that after the DeVos shooting, um, and then you know coming out of um, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests of, of last spring. Um, and this is why I say I'm a, I hope the moment doesn't go by. That's really what I need. You know, I, I think that that's, to me, that's there's there's nothing more central. Um, you know, there's, there's there's no more effective. There's that's the only way to really effect change um, at the university uh, in a meaningful way is to is to change the population of faculty who are here. And um, I hope that that will happen one day. It's something I'll continue to nudge for, um, you know. But I think there's some decisions that would have to be made, and a willingness to, you know, invest, you know, very significantly uh, in a way that has not happened as of yet. Uh, how have you seen the role of women change over time at the University of Cincinnati? Um, well, I, I, in a in a number of ways, there's certainly more women faculty than when I when I was first here and definitely in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, there also has been, there are many more women in, in administration than, uh, than there were um, starting, you know, first and foremost again, I'll, I'll say with Nancy Zimfer, when she was president of the university, I think she was an excellent president. And um, I think in some ways really sort of changed the tenor of the university um, in a way that, that I think we continue to benefit from uh, from now, but at the time that 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 Zimfer was president, um, Karen Gould was uh, was the dean of the college, um, and then this is you know um, after her, Valerie Hardcastle was dean. Um, it's much much more common, I think, uh, to have at least in the parts of the university that I'm most familiar with, um, uh, women in in you know positions um, in administrative positions than there were when I first started here. Um, in addition to there being an increase in the number of women on the faculty um, as well. And also, in, you know, that this is certainly true of my grad, my, the graduate program in my department, but um, I believe true in at least some others as well. There are many more women in geology than there once were. So. Uh, how would you say the University of, Sena of Cincinnati uh, supported or limited women's roles? I say, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, what did the University of Cincinnati do to support or limit women's roles? To support or limit? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, certainly they've, they've done some things uh, that are supportive. Um, obviously, in, in, you know, in setting up a substrate where women could advance to leadership positions, um, you know, I think that that's a, that that's a positive. There are, there are programs that have been, um, um, you know, directed, uh, Directed towards uh, women and, and, and women in leadership as well, um, you know, which uh, which I think is is very positive as well. It's gonna something else I was gonna think of that was not so positive, but um, um, I think it slipped away for the moment. I, I might come back to That's it if I remember. Sorry. Well, what type of research did you do at the University of Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and uh, if you had any collaborators or people who impacted your work, who were they? Oh. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a big question. Um, yeah. So my research, as I said before, I'm a paleontologist. Um, I study the history of life. I don't. I, I have never studied dinosaurs. Many people equate paleontology with dinosaurs, but that's not me. First of all, I study the um, uh, the fossil record of marine life. That is, um, animals that lived in the sea. Um, and so, for example, the bedrock of uh, of Cincinnati is very famous. Um, because it, it, um, it encompasses an, an interval of time called the Ordovician, um, the late Ordovician period, which was about 450 million years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, what is now Cincinnati was covered by, and a lot of what is now North America was covered by a shallow sea. And that sea um, was sitting in the southern tropics, because continents move and we were in a different place back then. <laughs> um, and um, so it's a shallow tropical sea. And it was teeming with life, and ultimately, those uh, a lot of the shelled creatures, the invertebrates, were preserved in the geological record. And um, I spent some of my time, have spent some of my time, studying the fossils right in this region, 
because this is a world famous natural laboratory for looking at um, how um, uh, the biota of the animals living on a seafloor changed uh, with changing environments in space and time. And you can also watch some evolutionary changes in action here by going through the layers of rock in the Cincinnati. And, but some of the other questions that I worked on were much larger scale. You can take this information um, and people for centuries now have been publishing information about the fossil species found in different parts of the world in rocks of different geological ages representing different environments. And um, I got interested in first for, the, for that Ordovician period uh, building a database of that information so that it turns out that the Ordovician was a really interesting time in the history of life because there was a, a really, really big increase, uh, one of the biggest increases in the history of life in biodiversity, that is the number of species living on the planet. Uh, during that interval, you can, you can see it by counting, counting up the different kinds of species uh, that we find in the geological record. And then at the very end of the Ordovician period, it was one of the so-called Big Five mass extinctions that took place in the history of life, a time when uh, a lot of species died off in a relatively short amount of geological time. And so I got interested in, in learning more about why this might have happened, and one of the things that helped me to do that was to build a database of occurrences from around the world that I could ask, you know, was, was there more extinction here than there was here, and so forth. This ultimately led myself and, and a bunch of my colleagues to develop a project called the Paleobiology Database, which goes on today. Um, it's, a, it's an online uh, resource that captures that kind of information for all of geological time all around the world, and, and even for dinosaurs. And so this one you know, includes all fossil organisms. And so people can use those data uh, to, um, to study uh, large-scale questions about um, how the biodiversity has changed and where it has changed and hopefully learn a little bit of something about why it has changed. And so that's been a big thrust of my career. And then um, I would say the, the, the other major one has, has involved working underwater. Um, that uh, um, I, I'm interested um, in sort of how fossils accumulate on the seafloor um, because I study marine fossil assemblages and we know uh, there's evidence in the rocks around Cincinnati that while this shallow tropical sea was sitting not far from the equator back in the Ordovician, it was subject to incredible hurricanes, uh, much stronger than what we see today simply because there's no analog for this you know, relatively shallow sea, you know, sitting in such a warm environment. And, and uh, ancient storms and layer after layer in the Cincinnati. And so that raises questions about how storms can affect um, the distribution, you know, the distribution of species that we see in those layers. And so um, I've actually spent some time studying uh, the accumulation of of layers of shells on seafloors, uh, working down in the Caribbean where I lived for a time, um, working at a marine lab a long time ago. Um, and, uh, and those accumulations are useful not only for trying to get a sense of how good the resolution of skeletal material deposited after these species are no longer living um, and, and subject to being moved around, how, how, how is the acuity of that fossil material uh, especially after hurricanes hit. I had the good or bad fortune, depending upon how you look, on it, look at it, to have um, had a group down in St. Croix a few years after I got to Cincinnati. Um, not expecting a hurricane to hit, but one did, um, a big hurricane called Hurricane Hugo. Um, and we had been collecting a lot of uh, samples along a transect uh, for the kind, the kind of work I was just describing. All of a, can, all of a sudden a hurricane hit. Um, this gave us, it was awful, and um, a lot one could say about it, but um, it gave us an opportunity scientifically to then go back and sample the same, from exactly the same places after the hurricane to see how much the hurricane affected distributions directly. And so um, that's another um, you know, part of what I do. Those accumulations are also useful um, in, for studying, um, you know, it's not just for trying to understand the fossil record, but also understanding uh, more recent changes to environments that humans have induced, so-called anthropogenic changes, because that record, um, if usually when an environment changes significantly, you know, because of human activity, what lives there changes, and you can actually see that in the accumulating record. One of my students and I 
a few years back, um, did some analyses just to demonstrate that the record itself, the accumulating record, actually had the acuity to, um, to detect those, those changes. And so that's a, and I also work on reefs. And then finally, the last thing I'll say, and this relates to collaborations, um, you know, in addition to having some mentors who were very important in my career, um, you know, when I was in graduate school um, back at the University of Chicago, and obviously some people here who in the, in the, in the geology and paleontology program who were close, close colleagues, uh, near the end of my, of sort of my research run, um, uh, I began collaborating with uh, colleagues in uh, bio biology, including current department head Teresa Cully, who is a plant biologist. And um, uh, we were studying and published a series of papers um, that also included uh, Guy Cameron, who was a, was a former head of, uh, of the biology department, um, and one of my former students, Sarah Colby, who um, was sort of spearheaded a lot of what we did. Um, we studied uh, the distributions um, and the, con the compositions of plant communities along an urban to wildland gradient. We were interested in the effects of urbanization on, and the impacts of urbanization on what lives in a forest, basically. And I won't go into all the technical details now, but it turned out to be really interesting. And it was very cool because I was, um, I was applying some of the principles I used to study in the, in the fossil record, the same kinds of things, sampling here, sampling there, sampling there, and then seeing how uh, compositions of things living on a seafloor uh, change as you go from one environment to the next. We can do the same thing with, with plants living in a forest. And so it was censusing and then using a lot of the same quantitative methods that we did in you know, the work I was more commonly doing. And so it was wonderful to be able to collaborate with my colleagues in biology um, on that work. And it was a, it was a, a nice culmination. So, yeah. well, <clears throat> uh, what's what athletics like during your time at the University of Cincinnati? Athletics. Um, uh, I would say that the profile of athletics has increased fairly dramatically. Um, when I first got here, uh, the football team wasn't very good and neither was the basketball team. And the basketball team was, was not playing on campus. I think they were just beginning to construct uh, what was called the Shoemaker, Shoemaker Center at the time. I believe it's, it's now called Fifth Third Arena. Um, and they, at that time, they were playing home games um, at, uh, uh, for one year at what was then called Riverfront Coliseum. What I forget, what I don't even know what it's called now, the arena downtown. And they played for a year or two at this place called Cincinnati Gardens, which has since been demolished, and then they moved on to campus. I think coinciding with around the time they moved on to campus, the basketball team began to improve a lot. Um, and, uh, um, and so it's actually been interesting to, more interesting to watch their games. Similarly, as you know, in the past decade, the football team has improved, decade plus now has improved um, uh, pretty dramatically. And um, so, um, you know, again, this is one of these things like construction where I kind of have, have mixed feelings, especially given the investment in athletics. On the other hand, I'm not unmindful that to students in particular, having successful athletic programs is a draw, especially for, well, mostly for undergraduate students. Um, and so certainly the profile, the athletic profile of the university has increased in the time that I've been here. Having said that, um, there was a time well before I got here where the university's basketball team won two national championships in a row. So. Um, and that hasn't happened since. They haven't, they haven't been once, and so um, you know, who knows? Uh, uh, goes up and down, I guess. Um. Uh, how do you think the student experience changed over your time? Oh, well, I just want to say one more about oh, athletics. Ahead, um, um, I'm really impressed, I, in part because my uh, neighbor was across the street from me, um, right here in Clifton, is the coach of the volleyball team, <laughs> and. Uh, I was very impressed. Um, I thought it was really, really, and this reminds me, I thought it was really cool that there were uh, several uh, athletes uh, with, uh, uh, with UC Connections who played in the most, in the Olympics just concluded in Tokyo, including a really, really good volleyball player. Yeah. <laughs> and who uh, I enjoyed watching until she uh, sprained her ankle. Um, but then the team won gold medal and she was a real anchor for, especially for the first half of the tournament. So. Yeah, had to throw that in. Oh, that's <laughs> How do you think the student experience changed over your time at the university? I've kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, there's a campus life now, and there wasn't um, when I first got here. Um, there really wasn't. There was no reason to be here at night on campus, um, but that certainly has changed. 
um, and I think there's a lot more for a student to do. And I think that's really, and it's, it's not trivial um, to say that, um, because I, I really, what I experienced when I was an undergraduate um, uh, was that what really impacted me moving forward were, was sort of the chance events that happened by meeting people, not in classrooms, but outside of them. Um, when I was in college, I, I worked um, first as a sports editor and then as a managing editor for what at the time was a daily student newspaper, um, and uh, you know the, that not only affected you know my writing skills and things like that, but just sort of the, the interactions, especially when you when you have to put out a paper every weekday and you're sort of managing the whole process. That definitely you know trans we talk about transferable skills. Those those are skills that have served me for a lifetime, and they were not in the classroom. Um, and there were other things that happened that caused me to encounter people that, and, you know, I won't go into all the details now, but, you know, impacted the career choices that I made. Um, and I, I suspect that there was a time when it was hard to really meet people as, as much as you can now, um, you know, at the university. And I, I'd like to think that that enriches people's lives in ways that affects them. Um, you know, in, in deciding what they want to do next, and maybe in many cases choosing directions that they wouldn't have, um, you know, if if life had been as uninteresting, if life were an, as uninteresting now as it is then, I, mean, I might have gotten it backwards, but I hope you get the point. Yes. <laughs> uh, what were conditions like for faculty, for faculty, and uh, what role did you play in the union? Oh, <laughs> I was actually. Um, uh, faculty, I think conditions have improved, um, and I think that's partly, you know, thanks to the university having become a state university, but also thanks to us, I think, definitely thanks to us having a unionized uh, um, uh, faculty. Um, I think the AUP has been instrumental in, you know, looking out for our rights. I think a lot of faculty tend to be insular. I hope that that's changing anyway, because I want all faculty to pay more attention to and, and act more in the outside world. Um, but let's face it, they don't as much as, and it, it's, it's good to know that, that, uh, you know, that union leadership was looking out for our, our, our rights over the years, um, especially as they relate to um, uh, security, um, not just health benefits and salary, um, um, but also you know, basic, basic rights as faculty members. Um, I, um, I actually went on strike <laughs> in, in uh, uh, I think it was, I want to say 1992, something like that, um, when uh, we had a one-week strike. Um, and uh, um, at the time, the, the president really was intent on, I, I think he thought that um, he could break the union. And he had a, a chief negotiator who um, really was intent on doing so, and it didn't happen. And so I think, it, I think the, the, you know, the outcome of the strike ten, turned out to be more or less a wash. Um, but you know, I think the union um, remained and you know, even thrived in the years since. Um, there was a period, um, I don't I'm sure I remember when it was now, but probably close to 20 years ago, maybe a little less than that, um, when um, I actually served as treasurer <laughs> of the AUP for um, about a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, and it turned out I really didn't have to do much as, as much of, you know, with respect to watching the books because they had somebody who did that. But I was on the board at the time, and so I was privy to lots of discussions going on in preparation, although I was not on the negotiating team, preparation for what was going to be the next contract at the time, and I found that interesting and fascinating, and it was a good, um, you know, upfront experience. Uh, was there any presidents of the university that you admired or had a perspective on their leadership? Yeah, I think I already mentioned um, uh, Nancy Zimfer. Um, I just, you know, sort of, um, th there was a broad range of people. Um, I should say that uh, Joseph Steger was, uh, was the president when I got here, and he was a very long-serving president, so he was around for quite, quite some time. Um, and um, I'll just say he had his good points and his bad points, and I'll leave it at that. As I've already said, I thought that Nancy Zimfer was, was you know, transformed sort of the sense of the university. And then it's sort of interesting to, you know, to see how other people have used the position over the years. Santa Ono, 
um, was sort of the uh, you know, the king of social media. Everybody wanted their picture taken with Santa Ono, um, and uh, he had been provost before he was president. Um, I think he was a better president than he was a provost because I don't think he was really interested or wasn't. His skill set was more on the communication side um, rather than the managing the university side, <laughs> um, and so I think. I think a president is a little bit more of a front person for the university than the provost, and the provost is more the person who, um, you know, is, is overseeing the, the real academic mission of the university, um, and perhaps more hands-on in that respect. And so, um, and so, Ono was, you know, was was impactful in that way. Um, um, I like Neville Pinto. Um, I he, he's not nearly as um, out there as Ono. Sometimes I wish he were a little bit more. On the other hand, um, he's very dedicated to the university um, and, um, um, and I think he's in, in it for the long haul, <laughs> which I see that as a positive. One thing that concerned me for a period of time at the university, not that I want our, our presidents to stay around for two decades, um, but I also don't want them to change every two years. And we've had a bit of a revolving, we had a bit of a revolving door for a while. Um, both for presidents and provosts, and it would be nice to have a stable period, because I think it, I think every every administrator at every level, you know, has a learning curve, and sometimes just as people were getting up to the point where they're ready ready to do something, they would leave, you know, and um, I think it's important to stay around for a while, but not too long. <laughs> <clears throat> what do you think your most important contribution to the university has been? No. Oh. I, that's that's not for me to judge. Um, I, um, I, don't know, I, I, I <laughs> here's, here's what I might say. Um, I, um, you know, I've, I've gotten some things done in research and, and in administration and in teaching, but um, I, 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 so I, for more than two decades, I taught um, an intro level course on the history of life for non majors. And it tended to have about 100 students in it. Um, this is just before the switch to semesters, and then um, things changed, and so the courses were not that, that large after that. Um, I I would run and still do from time to time, but it's not as common as it once was. When you started out adding up the years, you kind of realize that um, um, you've taught a lot of students, like you know a couple thousand or more, you know, and. Uh, um, I'd run into them in odd places. Somebody waiting on me in a in a restaurant would say, "I took your class, and I loved it." You know, and you know, just trying to raise consciousness about issues that I think are important. You know, one of the things I tried to do in that class was, you know, not only try to teach people about the world around them, but why they should care about it, and why they should stop to think about it. And um, you know, I I think that you know, clearly at least impacted those, those students who I would run into um, afterwards. And I think that that, um, you know, to me is, is a meaningful thing, especially if, it, it, if they stop and look around a little bit more when they're outside, or maybe one day, if, if and when they have kids, they do that, you know, with them. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to think I've, I've made a difference on that fundamental level. And to me, that, you know, that really matters as much as, you know, anything I've published, you know, or grants I've gotten. You know things that I, you know, units that I've served as an administrator. <clears throat> oh, did you have any important uh, mentors at the University of Cincinnati that we should know about? I know you talked about this, but uh, I'll oh. any more. Oh, um, yeah, certainly at at the university itself. Um, you know, certainly the, there were some uh, some colleagues uh, in the geology department. Um, who were important to me, especially you know early on, uh, Dave Meyer, um, Carl Brett came later, um, so I, you know he actually I was I was here for uh, almost 13 years before he got here, but he but he was an influence on me before he got here because he was somebody I knew you know in field field like mine. What's really interesting about it is that it's it's very personable and personal because it's not that big a field. Um, but it's also worldwide, you know, and so you get to know people on a first name basis around the world, you know, meeting them at different meetings, in some cases traveling to where they are and so forth. Carl was somebody I knew for a long time, and so he was sort of a, a bit of a mentor from afar um, before he came here as a faculty member, but obviously 
you know, his presence was important to me, along with Dave Meyer, who was also, you know, he was on the faculty as a paleontologist when I got here, and I think he was the chair of the search committee that, that um, um, you know, that hired me. And, uh, um, you know, those are a couple of examples of, of people who come to mind. Uh, would you say you liked your experience in general at the University of Cincinnati? Yes. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you why. Um, because I, I believed, um, first of all, it's been a really interesting place to be. It's been fun to watch it change over the years. Um, I think the fact that I've come, that I came back for five months, and only you know to do this this um, you know this acting job, um, I think is testimony to that. If I hated the place, I wouldn't have done that. Um, I don't want to come back forever. I, I like retirement, you know, um, but. Um, but I, I like it enough, and I remain fascinated enough by the university as an institution that I still want to be at least a little part of it, you know, from time to time. But you know, in terms of um, personal and professional development, this was a wonderful place for me. I, I felt I always felt that um, I always felt supported, you know, and I felt that uh, if um, uh, you know, if if I first of all, I felt supported in in being able to do my work. And do it well, and I felt in turn, if I did it well, I would be recognized for it, and I was, you know. And so, um, I felt that the that the university kept its promise. And this reminds me of something I was going to say um, on the not so po positive side with respect to with respect to women. I still think, um, and I think it continues, you know, to this day. Um, there's an imbalance in um, in the in I think the. I don't know if demand is the right way, but on the responsibilities put on women um, at the university to, to play service roles. And I think in some cases, you know, more so than men, maybe because men um, are, at least some of the men on our faculty are not willing to step up and play those roles. And so, you know, in the breach, you know, women are more likely to step up, it seems sometimes. And I think sometimes that's been not not to not to detriment per se, but it's impeded sometimes uh, develop you know professional development in other ways, and I think that the university has to do a much more conscious and conscientious job of of leveling the playing field in that respect. I think it's really important. I think that's also true for underrepresented groups, um, you know, who especially because you know there are so few um, you know black faculty, for example, on campus. Um, um, black faculty often get called upon, you know, and much more frequently than I think white men, especially, uh, you know, to serve on high-level search committees, which can be a lot of work, um, and then they're not rewarded for it, you know, and it's never, you know, it's not taken into account enough. But I think, you know, with, since you asked the question about women before, I think that that's something that, um, and I meant to say, but then it fell out of my head. I think that's that's something where the university really still needs to make progress. Um, and with more women in um, significant administrative positions over the years, um, and hopefully continuing into the future, um, I, I'm hopeful that that's an imbalance that can be um, addressed more effectively. Yes. Uh, is there anything you would like to talk about that I haven't asked you? <laughs> uh, not that I can think of. Uh, Am I slouching too much? Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your time, Professor sure, Miller. It's been a pleasure, really. Thank you.